Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. It takes a healthy pastor to lead a healthy church. And on today's podcast, we're going to explore how you can become a healthier pastor, husband, dad, and follower of Christ. As a pastor, you face daily demands of hitting targets in every area of life, whether they be personal goals, daily goals and long-term goals for your ministry, and so on. And along with that come the expectations that you place on yourself and, and that others place on you. It's no wonder burnout is a real thing. So how are pastors ever supposed to finish well? Well, in his new book, Start to Finish, Mark Dance helps ministry leaders find guidance to run the race well from start to finish. Mark Dance is the Director of Pastoral Wellness at Guidestone Financial Resources. He served as a lead pastor and church planner for 27 years before launching Lifeway Pastors and the Care for Pastors Network. And he is our guest today, here to talk about what you can do to stay healthy mentally, emotionally, physically, and certainly spiritually, and how that impacts your ministry. So, Mark Clifton, say hello to Mark Dance. Hello, Mark Dance. It is so good to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Mark. Sorry to be here, brother. Great you know, to be here. You know, Dan Hurst and I, your book, awesome book, Start Thank to you. Finish. Thank you. Dan Hurst and I have written several books. One of them, our most famous one, was We Have Yet to Finish. That's the name of our book. So. <laughs> <laughs> this one was, should have been subtitled Almost Finished. <laughs> Almost Finished. <laughs> well, Finish Last was the other book that we did. We just did that. So Dan, and I, Dan and I go way back. We, uh, we've been to college together and stuff. Our dads were roommates in college together. His dad wow. was an IMB missionary back in the day. My dad was a pastor. And, Dan and I went to college together. We started a lot of businesses, and we didn't finish any of them. So uh, we, 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 we're we, seeing if this podcast gig will work out for us. But we're grateful to have Mark Dance with us today. Man, I'll follow you on social media and, and uh, all kinds of places. Wherever you go, good things happen. You're a tremendous encourager. And Dan began this podcast with what we say all the time. It, it takes a healthy pastor to lead a healthy church. And uh, I think sometimes pastors... I know I do. I I spend a tremendous amount of time caring about my church, caring about my church family, worried about my church, working toward my church, and not near enough time in self-care and and caring about myself. And so, uh, man, I appreciate your book. But you've also just been around a long time. I mean, Oklahoma and and at Lifeway and as a pastor and now at Guidestone. So you've got – and you've got your finger on the pulse of pastors around North America. So – I want you to take a few minutes and, and just tell us some of the major struggles you see pastors encountering uh, right now in this day and age and climate in which we live. What do you see out there, Mark? Yeah, well, thank you. I'm, it's, uh, I love what you do also. And anytime we can do things together, it's a blessing. You know, when I ask pastors sometimes in some settings to pray together, one of the things that comes up, as I see on this screen right now, they're asking, first of all, the most consistent prayer request that I get from pastors is, would you pray for my kids? Okay. And right now, yeah, I'm a DK. There's an M, you know, you're an MK, you're a a PK. So this is the trifecta of, you know, (laughs) preacher's kid, missionary kid, deacon's kid. And, and, you know, our dad's, one thing they had in common, even as a deacon's kid, was the same job description in First Timothy 3. It says all the things that look for in a pastor, and likewise deacons, other than you don't have to speak, but but your 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 wife and kids are in there, and the word manage is in there twice. To, to, to manage or to lead, it's translated as lead in Romans 12, the same word, is that you've got to lead your life before you're even qualified to leave the church in any capacity. So it all starts with self-leadership, which is ultimately under the lordship of, of Jesus Christ. And that's where, that's where pastors get sideways. It's usually not over, sometimes it's usually not over theology. It's not usually over polity. It's, it's over 
you know, relationships and character and spiritual fruit. And so when, as you mentioned, self-care is, yeah. is, is it's, the, it's the subject really of my ministry in this book is to help pastors to take care of themselves, not for selfish reasons, but for strategic reasons. Our experience has been that pastors, especially bivocational pastors, pastors of single staff churches, well, all pastors, but that's that's sort of the lane we run in, Mark. Right. Uh, man, they are they are really busy. Uh, there's never an end to what they need to do. You know, my dad and 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 Dan's dad, and probably your dad, but as pastors, as deacons, as missionaries, um, they didn't they didn't have the expectation that they should be on call 24 hours a day because they didn't have an iPhone in their pocket. They right. didn't have uh, total access to the pastor through text, through email, you know, 24 a day. It's like if you get a text, the church members expect you to respond to that text, you know, within a very short amount of time. You know, our, our dads, you know, they had a phone at the church, right? And they could leave the church building right. and uh, and go back the next day, maybe answer the calls. I know we, we, didn't have an, we didn't even have an answer machine at our house when I grew up. We, those weren't invented yet. <laughs> and so, and people were pretty gracious. They never really called you at home, you know, past nine or 10 o'clock, unless it was an emergency. Right. But people don't mind texting the pastor at midnight, emailing him at midnight. And it's like, if, if he's not careful, he never shuts down. He never turns it off. And uh, talk to me a little bit about how you see that kind of environment. Just pastors overworked, overstressed, and like you said, not taking care of themselves. Um, so what, what's some insight you can give us on how to take care of yourself? Obviously your book is really amazing in that point, but let's say you've got a group of pastors sitting right here who are really stressed and tired and overworked and their family is strained. What's some of the first things they can do, Mark? Well, that's part of managing. It's a great question. It's part of managing your life. It's managing your time and creating boundaries for people and God's word. This is old school. I don't have any. I don't have any new answers here. Uh, the, the new challenges, as you mentioned, I mean, we've never in history been more accessible ministers have it, and subsequently more vulnerable. Yet we are the ones responsible for managing our lives in these boundaries, protecting ourselves, protecting our family, even protecting our ministry. And in doing so, we disciple the people that we're leading and it, the Bible starts off telling us the secret to marriage is to demote people, right? Genesis two, you want to, if you want to cleave, you got to leave, right? right. You got, you got to break up with your parents at the wedding. And then uh, after that, you're going to have kids. They need to be demoted or they're squatters, right? Right. And eventually. And then um, it never says stop loving your parents or your kids. In fact, the second greatest command comes from Leviticus 19, and one of the first applications is to honor your parents. That's in the Leviticus 19. But our church members need to be demoted. That means they don't need to get an answer. Rec- As you said, back in the day, you call somebody at night, weekend, or something like that, out of the norm, It's they, they probably have a real emergency. Now, right. people re- reach out for things that aren't even remotely <laughs> be defined as an emergency, and when we when we feel like we have to get back to them right away, I think we we enable them, and and when we wait or are more judicious about it, we we disciple them, and oh. we teach them because everybody that we serve is also looking for the balance of life and work, and if we model it for them, we disciple them and teach them how to prioritize the people that God tells us to prioritize. Wow, Mark, that's that is really really insightful. I hope you guys heard that. Um, Dan, flag the tape, and we'll we'll replay that sometime. Because <laughs> you know, I know in my own pastors are people pleasers, right? We're just wired to want to please people. Now, obviously, that's a that's a, a black hole because you can never please people, and right. you always feel like you're not living up to standards. But that's who we are. And you know, if if some dear lady texts us and wants to know about something in her Sunday school class that she doesn't need to know about for a day or two, but she texts us on Saturday night, we feel obligated to get back to her right away. And you're right; that is enabling that behavior. I never thought about that, Mark. We're and what we need to do, as you just said so wonderfully 
we got to model for them boundaries and and disciple them in that. But that takes, Mark, that takes a very confident pastor to do that. That's and true. That takes a pastor who's healthy. And if you're not healthy emotionally and spiritually and even physically, I think you're going to be far more prone to give in to those sort of urges to please people because you don't feel good about who you are. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with it. That's really, really good insight. Talk Thank to you. me a little bit about the book. What motivates you to write the book and what can your readers expect when they when they take a look at it? Well, the the book came from a challenge by a peer at, uh, at, at Lifeway when I I used to work there. Uh, Lifeway pastors got to start and serve that that ministry, which helped me uh, do what I'm doing now with seminaries, and state convention associations, etc. And when I was talking to B and H about writing a book, the VP of B and H at that time, Selma Wilson, Wilson said, "Your first book needs to be about your core message." And so that drove me to, okay, what's my core message? And it didn't take me long to realize that Jesus had already kind of defined that for me when um, I, I spent a, I spent several years ago, about 15 years ago, I spent a week in a cabin with fasting and praying, juice fasting and praying to seek in the Lord and reading the Bible. And the great commandment came alive to me. I'd heard it, read it, taught it. Everybody knows it. Described it when he asked Jesus what the greatest command was. Everybody did. They said it every morning and evening, as did their parents and grandparents. But the, fir- the, the, the words first and greatest or megos protos, that, that absolutely was a face mask moment for me. It was like everything came clear. For 20 years, I've been pastoring churches, aspiring to be a great commission pastor. That was my goal. And by every earthly standard, that was working. Church growing, baptizing, whatever. And you get lots of applause for that stuff. But I'm hearing Jesus quote Moses saying, your first priority is the most important thing you'll do today and tomorrow and the rest of your life is to love me. Right. And then, you know, the second thing, not just second in order, but in priority, love your neighbor. And, right. you know, which means the nearest one. And I looked on my calendar, Mark, and I was like, hmm, this doesn't reflect a great command. I want, I think I want to aspire to be a great commandment pastor because okay. I realized I've never met a great commandment pastor that wasn't a great commission pastor. Okay. But I've met a whole bunch of great commission pastors that weren't great commandment pastors. They were getting stuff done. They were changing the world, but they were arrogant jerks, right? <laughs> and oh, so, yeah. I mean, and I've been that arrogant jerk. And it's like, you know, I'm going to focus first part of my day. because, And so I, I stopped having morning breakfast meetings and stopped working out with a friend in the morning. It's like, you know what? Jesus says, I'm first. There's nothing unclear about that. And then neighbor that starts, you know, nearest one to me is Janet. So he made it super easy for me. Jesus and Janet are my king and queen. These are my first and second love. And if, 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 if either of them upset with me, I don't care how much applause I get in my ministry. I'm my world's upside down. But if I'm good with Jesus and Janet, honestly, I don't need the applause as much as I used to. That's great. So the book came out of that conviction and that moment, that face mask moment. And so the first half of the book, focuses on the first commandment. And so there's a chapter on heart, chapter on soul, chapter on mind, some of strength, you know, uh, loving God and how the, it, how integrated that is to defining what a healthy pastor really is, is a great commandment pastor, in my opinion. And then the second section, the last section is about great commission. It's, a, it's based on love your neighbor, which is basically the great commission. And so, um, we talked about the, the, the concentric circles because even though everyone is equal in God's eyes, we're not God. So never, everyone's not supposed to be equal in my life. Janet, after Jesus, is next in line. And if, if I put Janet in front of Jesus, I'm out of order. If I put the kids in front of Janet, out of order. You know, right? And, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm supposed to love everybody, even my enemies. And you know all this stuff. Actually, everybody that reads this book already knows this stuff. We're just 
honestly reminding them of what they already know to do and, in, and emboldening them to do it. Because like you said, you're exactly right. It takes courage. It takes courage to, t- to take Sabbath seriously and, and to stop every week. It takes courage to not be the solution to everybody's problem. Yep. So that's what it's about. Well, that's what it's about. Then that's what everybody who's listening to this podcast needs, including me. Um, I'm I'm like 120 years old right now, and I've been doing ministry for a hundred <laughs> years. My dad was a pastor. My great granddad was a pastor. I've lived my whole life in the Southern Baptist ghetto. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I crawled over the wall a few times and and came back in, but. Uh, so I, I know the culture of pleasing people, of trying to be all things to everybody. You get a lot of affirmation for that, Mark. Yeah. Oh, brother so-and-so, he's always here. He never forgets anything. He always gets back to me. You want to be that, but at the expense, as you said, of your primary relationship to our Lord and your relationship to your wife and children and to your own health, it's detrimental. And we all know that if if Satan uh, doesn't get us to do wrong, he'll get us to do right in a wrong mm-hmm. way. I know that's bumper sticker, but it, it is true, actually. Yes. And we have to constantly be – I love what you said. I never really put my mind on that, that it is the great commandment, uh, and, and that will lead to the great commission. And you're right. As Southern Baptists, we jump to that great commission constantly, and uh, we even value pastors who, like you said, produce. We talk about that a lot on this podcast um, you can produce a lot in a church, and then you can leave that church and it all fall down because basically it really wasn't ba- built on much but your personality and your yeah. work ethic. Um, and so that's that's another issue. But this is a great book. I, we highly commend it to you Thanks. start to finish. It will really help you do these things that we talk about on this podcast a lot. Prioritize your life. Uh, get it ordered in a way that you can be healthy over the long term. We talk a lot about not being a – uh, a sprint, but a marathon, and that's what ministry is. In fact, Mark, we our mantra here is in revitalization, you preach, pray, love, and stay. And mm. uh, you can stay when you're healthy and when you're in a good place. Uh, but you travel yeah. all over the country. You speak to pastors and their wives. Your wife also does that. Uh, again, you know, what What are you seeing out there when you talk to pastors uh, with with the polarization of our nation, of politics, with you know, still coming out of COVID and all that went through that. What do you? What do you talk? We always want to ask our guests, what are they seeing? We what? What are your? What are your eyes seeing? What are your heart? What do you see among pastors uh, when you're out there as much as you are? Well, I think the what I see the most uh, in terms of challenges, uh, I see fear sometimes. Okay. Fear, fear of a failure mm. sometimes can be a healthy fear. You know, you want to be afraid to, to blow up your life. You want a healthy fear of, of doing something stupid. But um, sometimes the the fear of, of being isolated. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, that's the most avoidable one because – I, I, I tell this to, to, to pastors and wives when we when we do events together and really about half of the events I do are, are primarily sponsored by the North American Mission Board. I'm doing it for state conventions or whatever. You guys have been really shucking some corn here when when it comes to putting your money where your mouth is. If you want to help a pastor finish well, then you're going to help. Um, the pastor's wife as well. And Kathy Litton's been doing that phenomenally uh, for a long time. And sometimes we get to do that together. But w- w- when when Southern Baptist, if you're Southern Baptist pastor or planner, and I've been both do it, doing this, just know that you're not just part of the biggest family and that you know, we're not summarized by our, our latest resolution. We are for years... We have people locally, nationally, regionally that would fall. We would fall over ourselves to help you if you ask. Yeah. And no, so. I, no, you, you're right. And I don't mean to interrupt you there, but but I, I just wanted to affirm that. But you have to ask, Mark. That's right. That's right. I talk about in the book, my my challenge with uh, clinical depression about Almost 15 years ago, it was the middle of a relocation of a 
fairly large church. And I, I looked fine on the outside and my doctor diagnosed me. And a week later, uh, a therapist diagnosed me separately. She diagnosed me from the pew. Both were church members. I was like, I don't have time for that. Whatever that is, you know, I mean, I took a counseling class at seminary, but that didn't make me a counselor. <clears throat> but pastors, we're caregivers and, and getting somebody, letting people help us is counterintuitive for caregivers. Oh, but yeah. we, we are not going to finish well if we try to do it alone. And, you know, the people that deal with, with loneliness and isolation more than the pastors is their wives. Mm. They're the ones, they're, they're more isolated. And some of it is, you know, we stiff arm people, whether it's, uh, denominational people or church members or something that want to love us, want in our lives. And we, we keep them. If we keep them at a distance, yeah. then if you're the pastor, you're the most responsible person in your house and in your church. So steward that well by making sure that you're getting what you need and your wife's getting what she needs, your children. And, and, and which means you're going to have to let people in. And so loneliness is one of the most avoidable things, especially in the Southern Baptist Convention, because we've got them everywhere. You guys have ambassadors and catalysts and events and guidestones there when, you know, when I'm there and Hans and others. I mean, uh, it, it, the state convention associations, so many Southern Baptists have been rallied to not just help you start well, but to stay well and to finish well. And so if you're struggling and you probably are at one thing or another, it might be mental health, might be spiritual health, might be physical health, let people help you. It's okay. It's not just okay. It's, it's strategic. Self-care is strategic. It's not selfish. And Paul told Timothy twice to take care of himself yep. first. Yep. First, first in, in Acts 22, he says, pay attention to your life and your flock. Yep. Or guard, you know, depending on your translation. And is it in, 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 and then in his follow-up letter, that was the last time he saw him face-to-face. -face. And then follow-up letter, 1 Timothy 4, he says again, pay close attention yep. to your life. Yep. And this time, instead of flock, he says doctrine. Right. And so, you know, we, we, we learn in seminary how to take care of our flock and doctrine, but we don't learn how to pay attention to our life, which both times he says comes first. That's a good word. I, that really is. And, you know, you'd mentioned clinical depression. Um, you know, I, I it's so common. We, we, we've had a whole podcast on this. Uh, depression among people who, who serve our Lord. Um, even if you go all the way back to, you know, to Elijah and, and uh, leaving Mount Carmel and running and hiding off in a cave and letting his servant go because he's done with ministry. Uh, and then more recently, Judson and Spurgeon and even Martin Luther. Uh, you know, it, 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 I'm convinced that that depression is Satan's favorite tool to use on us. And and you mentioned clinical depression, and and you know Martin Lloyd Jones wrote a wonderful book, uh, Spiritual Depression. As as a medical doctor, he acknowledged clinical depression, but he also said if you if you have that, Satan doesn't give you a pass on it. He 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 doubles down on that, and you have to work even harder on it. And um, yeah. So I was yeah. I was well into my ministry before I really uh, leaned into a group of young elders and and started exposing my life to somebody. Uh, I always kept myself pretty closed off. And at that point, just like you, I had a, a young elder who was a physician, and they they met me at church one night. Uh, and they wanted to meet with me, and they basically said, you know, you have clinical depression. We see it here. The and I. I'd never shared that with anybody, but it, it was a turning point in my life to acknowledge that and not be ashamed of it and know it's something that I, I battle and that, that I, I seek to find victory over. And so guys who are listening to us, you know, the first thing is just acknowledge it's not a failure if you feel that way. It's not a failure if you have it. It's a failure if you don't reach out and do anything about it. It'll get worse. It won't get better on its own. And right. uh, so I, I appreciate your information on that. And again, just want to point you to the book. Um, Start to finish by by Mark Dance. It's on it's B and H, so you can get it there. You can buy it anywhere. 
Yeah, uh, you can get it any place, Amazon or any place like that. But Amazon will they'll they'll send it they'll deliver it to your house before lunch if you order it this morning. They'll get it. There. No kidding. So we'd love to have you. Hey, by the way, thanks again for being here. You need to be aware of Mark and his ministry. Grateful for Guidestone for providing him this platform to care for pastors. Uh, it's a great opportunity for him to do that. It's a great ministry of Guidestone. And talk about an entity that that really does care and love pastors. Mm. It's Guidestone. And, yes. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, when you're talking about health care costs, sometimes people get all riled about that. But, you know, Guidestone does absolutely they can to help every pastor. And, you know, my my wife, she's very committed to mission dignity and our mm. church is, too. And it's one of the wonderful Amen. things they do. So learn more about Guidestone. Learn more about Mark Dance. You can find him online. He has a website and you just need to follow him. And if he and his wife are anywhere doing any kind of conferences put on by a state convention or association or NAM or Guidestone, Make yourself available and go there. You will not be disappointed. Mark has a wonderful ministry and a Thank great you. heart. And, Mr. Dance, we have something here we call the final four. The last <laughs> four questions we ask you. And if you answer them well, you receive a prize. Uh, as our team travels across North America, we stay in a lot of um, medium-class motels. And uh, we have collected a fine collection of uh, uh, of like toiletries, small, you know, little toiletries. And we'll put those in a, some of them have even been unopened and we'll put those in a basket and send them your way. If you answer these questions uh, correctly, first of all, you are in Texas now. Is that right? I am. Yes. But you, you spent some time in Oklahoma. So if you're going to go to the, the red river rivalry there, would you root for, would you root for Oklahoma or would you root for the Longhorns? Who would you root for? Well, if I'm sitting with my boss, Hans Dilbeck, I'm going to root for the, so- the Sooners um, because I can read an org chart. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, the Longhorns. All right. All right. Well, I, we're in the big we're here at Kansas. All right. So we're holding down the Big 12 while everybody else leaves. But, um, hey, we picked up some good teams. It's going to be a, a fun experience. But anyway, that's a whole nother story for another day. All right. Let's let's say this. Let's say. What was the very first Christian concert you ever went to? When was that and who was it? Do you remember? In yeah, person. I do remember. Um, it was it was Amy Grant in Tyler, Texas, my hometown. And uh, this young kid opened up for her uh, named Michael W. Smith. And, be- <laughs> and they hired local teenagers from youth groups to help uh, set up and break down equipment. And before and uh, Amy Grant's uh, husband at that point uh, and Michael W. Smith and a couple of us played football in the auditorium, um, you know, before the concert started. So. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Hey, yeah. That's a real vivid memory in your mind. There. It was. It was fun. You know, yeah. You know, she had her father's eyes, you know. That. <laughs> <She did. laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, want to and then let's say this. Let's say you're going to have to go on a on a transcontinental air flight and you have to listen, you have to listen to one person's um uh playlist on their iPhone. Would you would you be more inclined to listen to uh uh Ben Mandrell's uh, Kevin Azell's or Tom Rainer's, which do you think you'd be more inclined to listen to? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go with Rainer on this one. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, because I really, um, I really love seventies music yes. and I think he does too, if I remember right. Oh man. Yes. But I, I love, I'm an eighties kid, but I, I love seventies. music. That's what I listen to all the time. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. does, man. We we would do podcasts, and he would have his little Siri there or whatever. And and between podcasts, he'd say, "We need to get some energy going here." And so he would ask Siri to play something from the '60s or '70s, and then he would tell me all about that group and who they were and what they did. And, oh know, yeah, so. yeah. He's like he got a Pentium processor in his in his head of some type. He's so <laughs> so intelligent. <laughs> and he, and he, and he'll also let you know that. By the way, he's not ashamed to <laughs> remind you. Um, <laughs> I do miss him. Uh, okay, the last question. This is a, this is an easy one. You know, we always ask everybody that comes on. If you had to choose between bluegrass or southern gospel and spend an evening listening to one or the other, you don't have a choice. You got to go one or the other. Would you choose bluegrass or southern gospel? Hello. Uh, that's <laughs> that's painfully hard. Oh, it is not. Oh uh, no, no, no. I, I'm I'm gonna go with bluegrass. All right, very good. That's yeah. that's that's yeah. the right answer. We we like bluegrass on on uh, 
in the replant world. Um, Especially live. If it's, yeah. if it's a live album, that's going to be awesome. That's right. Yeah. Bluegrass is like hockey. It's really a lot better when you see it in person. That's uh, it. That's it. That's All right. Well, I bet you didn't know this is where that was going to go, but you, you answered well, so we'll send you something in the mail. Thank you for <laughs> thanks for being with me. Hey, once again, check out um, everything you can about Mark Dance online. Um, uh, Kyle, who's over here playing Candy Crush right now, he'll he'll be able to put into the show notes uh, Mark's website, how you can get the book, all of that. I want to encourage you to do that. And thank you, Mark Dance, for being with us. Really thank appreciate you. your time. Really appreciate your ministry. Thank Dan you, Mark. Hurst, take us home. Thank you, Dan. Kyle, appreciate you guys. Y'all press on, man. Your ministry matters. It really does. Thanks, guys. If you listen to our podcast on a platform that allows you to subscribe, please do so. And if you are given the option of liking the podcast, please please click that. All of that helps us to market the podcast and get the word out about what we're doing. A big thank you to the North American Mission Board for sponsoring this podcast and making it possible. We're grateful. And by the way, uh, we're looking at some options to make the podcast more accessible and useful for you, uh, ways that we can communicate more effectively, whether it be a Facebook page or a web page, maybe posting Mark Clifton's personal phone number, stuff like that. Uh, So if you have any suggestions, uh, please let us know. And join us again for our podcast of Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. And we would even come over to your house and do the podcast live in your living room if you would uh, feed us a meal. Well, well it depends on the snacks. I mean, let's be honest. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.